I appreciate this is going to sound a little bit random, but I want to tell you all today about the time that I met Sir Trevor MacDonald. It was uh, at my sister's graduation. He was getting some kind of honorary degree, and he gave a speech. I was sat right at the back of the room, um, so all I could really see between everyone's heads was that he was wearing at the front this really awful, garish, multicolored graduation robe. Afterwards, I got a chance to meet him in person um, and to see his hideous technicolor dream coat right up close. It was several years after this meeting that I first found out completely by accident that none of it ever actually happened. Turns out Trevor MacDonald hadn't been at my sister's graduation. So there was no speech and there was no Technicolor dream coat. But once I was forced for a second to doubt my own memory, I realized a bigger problem with it. I wasn't at my sister's graduation either. <laughs> now these kind of mistakes, they really shouldn't happen to me. You see, I'm a lecturer, I'm a researcher who studies false memories. I study how and why people come to remember things differently from how they really happened, or things that never happened at all. So you'd think then that I would know the signs that I'm remembering something untrue. Apparently not. Let me take you back or back a few steps, though, because many of you might think of remembering as being something a bit like a library, where you can go into the archives and you pull a memory down from the shelf, and each time you open it up, you can see the same words and pictures each time. But it isn't like that. Remembering, if anything, is more like telling stories, where, yes, we might miss certain details out each time, but we might also confuse or change or simplify details for ourselves. But importantly, we might also invent details. And it's difficult for us to think of remembering as being like telling stories to ourselves, in part because it doesn't tally with our everyday experience of feeling like our memories map perfectly onto reality. But it's also difficult for us to know when our memories don't map onto reality, because memories, to an extent, are our reality. And our values, our beliefs, our preferences, our identity are all shaped up in what we remember. So why would we want to doubt any of that even for a second? Maybe it would reassure you then if I told you that scientists now know of a way of telling for sure whether any particular memory is true or whether it's false. I could tell you that today, but I would be lying to you. Um, in fact, still, even despite decades of excellent research on this topic, we still only really have rules of thumb ways of making educated guesses. We don't have any cast iron guarantees. And so what that means in most cases, the only way we can really know for sure if a particular memory is true or false is if we can prove it, if we can go and find strong, independent, corroborating evidence that proves or disproves, confirms or disconfirms the way we're remembering. Most cases, we couldn't really even reasonably expect that kind of evidence to exist. And our research shows that even when that evidence might exist, people tend to be pretty reluctant to go out and put time and effort into trying to find it. Perhaps because we just trust our memories so much, it doesn't seem worth the hassle going around trying to prove or disprove our memories all the time. But what my Trevor MacDonald memory illustrates quite well is that people do sometimes find out that their memories are untrue, often by accident. Take my dad, for instance, who, while tracing his family tree, found out that his grandfather, who he remembers spending time with as a kid, actually died before my dad was born. Or take the novelist Ian McEwan, who recently described having ransacked his house looking for a perfect, 40,000-word manuscript that he eventually conceded he must have never actually written. In recent years, we've spent some time studying what happens to people's memories after they stop believing in them. And by and large, the answer seems to be not very much happens. Our memories can stay persistently vivid and rich, persistently compelling, long after we've stopped treating them as real memories. 
How many of your memories might turn out the same way if you were to afford them a moment of doubt? Well, this problem gets a bit bigger when we accept that sometimes even when there is evidence that fits with our memories, it doesn't always guarantee that they're true. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, we conducted a series of studies in which we filmed participants as they um, observed and copied various different actions. A couple of days later, we got them back in the lab and we showed them some clips from these videos. What we didn't tell them was that we'd added in some extra clips, some fake clips that we created using digital video editing software. And these extra clips seemed to prove that they'd performed extra actions that they hadn't really done. We found that up to half of the time, people later told us that they could clearly and vividly remember performing those actions that we'd faked into the video. It seems that when we're faced with misleading evidence, even about our own recent behavior, we can respond to that by creating quite rapidly memories that fit with that evidence and that corroborate that misleading evidence. And in fact, we don't even need to be misled. Sometimes even the truth can create false memories. In one study, pairs of participants watch a watched a video together that had been filmed from two different perspectives. Witness one, from their perspective, sees at one point that a woman steals a wallet from a desk. Witness two sees nothing at that point. Their view uh, is obscured by a wall. The pairs are later asked to discuss what they've seen and then separately tested on what they remember. The researchers here found that of those people who hadn't seen the theft, 60% nevertheless said they'd seen the girl steal a wallet. These people haven't been misled. Their partners quite accurately have told them what they saw. But it's they who've made the mistake of thinking, assuming that if you remember a theft, and if I can kind of picture that theft in my mind, then the picture in my mind must then be a memory. So just because someone remembers the same as you doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a true memory. In fact, it's plausible that even if tens or hundreds or thousands of people remember the same as you, you might still have a false memory. In 2013, when Nelson Mandela passed away, a lot of people were confused because they thought they remembered him having died years before. And when these people went to the internet, they found hundreds of other people who seemed to share the same false memory. Some even said they remembered his funeral back in the 80s. In other instances of this kind of effect, we see people collectively remembering the same dodgy 90s movie that was never actually made. Or remembering that back in the day, on maps, they used to put New Zealand on the west of Australia, not on the east. Our false memories like these, and many others, they're probably quite inconsequential. They don't have huge impacts on our lives. And so one reason why we don't often find out about them. But false memories can be consequential, and the consequences can be important. We might, for example, fail to take our vital medication because we falsely remember already taking it. We might argue with our partner over confl conflicting memories of who it was that invited around that unwelcome guest for dinner. We might vote a particular way, based on a rosy nostalgia that misrepresents how much better things really used to be in the past. Or we might take away an innocent person's liberty because a witness's memory mistakenly places them at the scene of a crime. In practice, despite all of the research that I and colleagues have done showing the ways in which memories can be unreliable, and despite my own personal experiences of knowing that I've remembered things confidently that for sure never happened, I nevertheless, I don't go around constantly doubting that I can put faith in the things that I do remember. And nor should you. Because to do that all the time would be debilitating. But in this supposedly fake news, post-truth world, where we're all increasingly being told to be suspicious of who might be lying to us at any one time. We should all remember that our memories lie to us too. And so when our reality comes into question, 
we should all be prepared at least a little bit to leave some room for doubt. Thank you.